It's having a genuine identity crisis. I mean, let's face William. I mean, William's natural role in life is to be the manager of a second division football club. That really is all he's capable of. Now, normally this wouldn't matter because there would be a machinery around him mm. um, that shepherded him in mm. the right direction. There isn't. David Starkey, have Prince Harry and Meghan Markle damaged the royal family by encouraging a reparations debate, which we saw at the recent Chogham, is very much on the agenda for Commonwealth countries? Um, I really think, um, I hate to say this, that Harry and Meghan don't matter. They really don't. I mean, clearly... Um, it wasn't helpful. The real problem, Dan, is, I'm afraid, the king himself. Um, the, the, the problem with the monarchy at the moment is very simple. Legitimately, people ask, what on earth is it for? That's the problem. Um, and I'm afraid it's not only the king. We've got to go back. And I know at the moment... Um, there is still the convention to say that Queen Elizabeth II was absolutely wonderful. Yes, in many ways she was. Um, that admirable devotion to duty and whatever. But equally, she wasn't quite what she appeared to be. The essential, why do we have a monarchy? What is the reason that the monarchy survives um, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, um, in Denmark, uh, in Norway, in Sweden? Countries which are amongst the most secure, the most free, the most prosperous in Europe. Why? Because what monarchy is, it is the, the testament above all to the fact there's been no break in our history. There's been no revolution. There's not been none of the tearing apart, which more than anywhere else is seen in France. The reason that French government lurches from crisis to crisis, from riot to riot, uh, from regime to regime. Remember, in France, there have been, since the revolution of 1789, there have been, listen to it, five republics, mm. two monarchies and two empires in two centuries. And you can see now the Fifth Republic is collapsing. The Fifth Republic is collapsing before our eyes. In other words, the reason that those countries on the northern fringe of Europe have been so stable, so prosperous and so free is, as I've been saying in the earlier part of this program, because they have reconciled their history and their modernity. They have recognized that history isn't as dreadful Tony Blair used to say, oh, there, uh, everything is all about being new. History isn't. We can't escape our histories. Countries that actually have revolutions don't escape their history. France didn't escape its history by a revolution. China didn't. Russia didn't. What every revolution does is to reproduce the worst aspects of the previous regime. What you have in China now with Xi or whatever he calls himself um, is simply another mad emperor. Mm. Putin is another vile czar using the worst machinery of uh, of, of Tsarist Russia. Um, Macron was simply a deluded mini Napoleon, or perhaps a mini Louis XIV, he even wore red heels. Um, you know, preposterous figures. Um, we have avoided that. And But the monarchy, what is the monarchy then? The monarchy should be the symbol of a stable politics that's firmly grounded in the political conventions. And what do we mean by political convention? It's so easy to forget it. Look, what do we have at the moment? We have a government that was elected by what? One in five mm. of the electorate, in which only just over a third of the people actually voting in the election voted for it. Were there scenes in Downing Street? Were there Trumpian scenes of storming Downing Street? No. Were there riots as there are in France? No. Was there, France, is in, France had a very similar election result to what we've had, in which roughly one third, one third, whatever, between the political parties. It's now in a political crisis which has been going on for months mm. and is clearly insoluble. 
We, on the other hand, because we had that stable first-past-the-post system, despite the fragility of Labour's victory in terms of actual numbers of people voting for it, nobody challenged its legitimacy. But that's because that's the way we do it that we don't faff around with election with with voting machines and whatever we all go in an orderly fashion mm. um uh, to our uh, to our polling station and we put a little cross on the bit of paper and it goes into the ballot box and it's properly counted and the following morning all the results are known that's what we mean and the monarchy is was should be the coping stone for all of that when you have that state opening of parliament it is the invocation of that 800 year tradition that gives us our freedom that gives us our prosperity that gives us everything that we've enjoyed but the problem is what the problem is that the queen only as it were preserved the externals she read her red boxes. The real background role of the monarchy, and you can see this very clearly in the late 19th and 20th century, you can see it in continental Europe. The proper role of the monarch is to act as a kind of political referee, because the system needs a referee. As you can see at the moment, we're left with somebody like like Lindsay Hoyle, the speaker as referee, and hopelessly inadequate to the task. Um, the, traditionally, that was the role that was played by the monarch. The Queen, I'm afraid, decided it was too difficult and too dangerous. And after having tried to play the role of referee, when she um, oversees the succession uh, to Harold Macmillan and effectively chooses Douglas Hume over, 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 over R.J. Butler, she decides it's too difficult. And do you know what she does instead, Dan? She witters on about the Commonwealth. Mm. It is the problem. She should have been primarily Queen of the United Kingdom. Instead, she sees herself essentially as queen of the Commonwealth. Yes. And this is the disaster that's happened. In other words, that the empire has come back to rule Britain. It's take, the empire has taken over the monarchy. Mm. And uh, the, in other words, there's been this, it's like Rome, it's exactly the same happened with Rome. So you stand, the, it's, again, it's this business of standing things on their head. And of course, what that means is that you are peculiarly open to all the absurd pressures of racism and whatever. And as we've seen, um, particularly um, in, 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 in the last year or two, uh, we've seen a monarchy that leans over backwards with, with the absurdities of, of anti-racism which as we know is profoundly racist look at look at the look look at look at the treatment um of of lady hussey yes. uh, uh, in the face of whatever she was called something or another fulani wasn't she this Endo absurd Zifalani, woman who, who claimed absurd... that she was racist because she simply asked where she was and as you say william threw his own godmother under the bus his own, within his hours. own godmother under the bus and it was even worse of course I mean, here was a figure dressed up um like a bar stool in las vegas i mean i've never seen anybody wear more leopard skin print you know and uh, which is and and lady hussey of course is a woman who actually knows african names she knows genuine african dress and you see this kind of absurd figure uh, who is a, a kind of Afri pan africanist parody um, uh, but you are expected to take it seriously. And again, uh, the 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 behaviour of Charles um, uh, at the uh, Commonwealth Conference, he has no defence against this um, because you've fully subscribed to this stuff. I mean, it is again the problem, isn't it? I mean, we all used to laugh at the typical royal visit. You know, you wear a straw skirt or you 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 rub noses or something preposterous like this, and it was all really quite innocent and and rather silly. But once it starts to fuse with critical race theory. Once it starts to touch reparations, you can then, slavery reparations, you can then see what goes mm. desperately wrong. Now, equally, what should be happening is that you would have a government and a prime minister that would have language that can resist this. But again, Dan, let me try to explain what's happened. Um, why, ha why did we 
roll over with the Chagos Islands. Why are we, despite everything that Starmer said about not considering reparations, why did the Commonwealth communicate, the, the, the heads of government communicate, contain a reference to it? Because do you know what is also involved in this thing called the rule of law? It's not only that you have the rule of law incorporating human rights, which as we can see means anti-democratic, quoting Lord Bingham, um, uh, bias towards minorities, you've also included international law. Mm. Now, international law is a fiction, a mere academic fiction. And the bodies that allegedly enforce it are all associated with the United Nations. And as we can see, we talked about corruption before, corrupt from top to bottom. Mm corrupt from top to bottom. Uh, the Security Council, uh, with, with, with the deeply intelligent but utterly, utterly malign figure um, of, 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 of Russia and its brilliant foreign minister dominating the thing, the uh, um, bodies like UNESCO and whatever, um, uh, and the committees on, on human rights, actually with representatives of Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia and so on, beyond, utterly beyond parody, an international court purporting to sit judgment uh, on, on Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, chaired by somebody who is Lebanese um, and, and with, with a public prosecutor, with a prosecutor disgracefully from Britain, uh, who is again um, a, a Muslim. I mean, and also subject to all sorts of charges, as yet, of course, are unproved uh, of, of, of sexual harassment and whatever in the workplace. The whole thing is, is really corrupt from top to bottom. But if you profess to believe in international law, as we saw in the Chagos Islands, without a single attempt at defending the national interest. We no longer have a government that believes in the national interest. The, f remember, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development mm. Office. Um, there is, we've, we've abandoned any notion that there is a thing called defending Britain or defending British people or defending British interests. And the monarchy itself, I'm afraid, is just slipped into this. And what is most dreadful, Dan, and this is one of the reasons I think we were talking about GB News, um, uh, in general, my coverage of the coronation and, and of the Queen's funeral, as you know, was lauded to the skies. Because unlike Hugh, Hugh boring, corrupt, Ed, another corruption, Edwards, I can actually say something out of my head. I have the knowledge, I can do it, and I have the style to carry it off. But I dared to say some of the true things. I dared to point out that at his coronation, thanks partly to King Charles, partly to Archbishop Welby, the entire tradition of the coronation of the last 300 years was thrown right mm. out of the window. That from 1689 onwards, every coronation was a primarily, well, all coronations were political acts, but it was a political act in a very special sense. From 1689 onwards, we undoubtedly have a parliamentary monarchy. That's why there is the state opening of parliament. That's why we talk about the houses of parliament. They're not. It's the Palace of Westminster. It's why there is the Queen's entrance, the old Queen's entrance there. It's why there is the Royal Gallery. It's why there is the, the splendid throne in the House of Lords. It's mm. a parliamentary monarchy. And at every coronation from 1689 onwards, this fact was shown by the fact that every member of the House of Commons and every member of the House of Lords was present. They were, the, in other words, the king was crowned before the representatives of the political nation. What does Charles do? What does Welby do? At a single stroke, they abolished that. And Sunak, and again, this is where I was criticized by Juby News. I said, why on earth does this man, who is so intelligent, I mean, as we saw, and I said this, look at Sunak's performance when he was responding to Rachel Reeves' budget speech. His response was brilliant, 
simply brilliant. He has got that command of figures. He has got that retentiveness. He has got that analytical skill. He could produce a response that would have taken most people three weeks of going through the detail. And he could do it while she was ranting away and trying to laugh at him. And he was able to do it. But he finally lacks that simple sense of what should a coronation be? What should um, a prime minister do with D-Day? Um, and his proper role would have been, and any prime minister properly soaked in our political system would have said to the king, sir, you cannot do that. You might want to do that, but what you're doing is you're letting the side down. You're letting the side down, and what are you letting it down for? You're letting it down with 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 sub for, with this that 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 wonderful nineteenth century phrase, sublime mysticism and nonsense. The whole business of holy oils, you know, ma marin marinated in an orthodox monastery somewhere or another. That's not what the coronation is about. The coronation nation is about, if you like, the sanctification mm. of political power, the legitimation of political power. And Charles refused to do that. Yeah. Every single mention of the word politics, which there was in the old service, was deliberately eliminated. You invented normally when the king is given the sword, when the king is given the swords, these are the swords of justice and these are the swords to do righteousness, to punish the evil and to reward the good. Do you know what, Dan? That was actually cut out because it sounds a bit mm. unkind, doesn't it? You had to invent this absurd ritual. Oh, there's a glove. Now, you have a glove because, of course, when you handle a broadsword, you need a glove. And do you know what? They invented this ritual. We give them a glove so the hand of justice is cushioned and tender and doesn't actually really hurt it. Do you see what I mean? The whole of our nonsense in which we only punish people, you know, like the odd white rioter um, and everybody else we let out of jail, I'm afraid was actually written into the coronation service. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. Every man knows the unbeatable feeling of a fresh barbershop shave. Now, what if I told you that you no longer have to wait weeks or even months between appointments to experience it? I'm introducing Manscaped's latest release, the Chairman Pro Package. The all-in-one set includes everything you need to recreate the luxury of a professional shave right at home. Whether you're after that daily silky smooth finish or prefer to maintain a rugged five o'clock shadow, the Chairman Pro package has you covered. First up, we have the star of the show, the electric foil shaver. This isn't just any shaver. It comes with two interchangeable skin safe blade heads. You have the four blade foil for that close smooth shave when you're looking to go absolutely clean. And you have the skin safe stubble trimmer for when you want to keep a bit of a rugged look. Both heads are designed with skin safe technology to help reduce razor burn and irritation so your skin feels smooth and comfortable after every shave, reducing redness or discomfort. A standout feature that truly differentiates the Chairman Pro from the rest is flex adjust technology. This innovative tech ensures a superior shave by allowing both blades and the pivoting head to seamlessly adapt to the unique contours of your face and is gentle on the neck area, helping you maintain great contact with your skin at every angle. And the Chairman Pro is waterproof, so you can use it right in the shower. It simplifies the cleanup to just a quick rinse under the sink and you're all set. It isn't just for daily shaves either. It is powerful enough to tackle up to five day growth, making it perfect whether you're shaving every day or just tidying up after a few days. With up to 75 minutes of runtime on a single charge, you won't have to worry about running out of juice mid-shave. It also comes with a travel lock to help keep it from accidentally powering on during travel. But that's not all. The package also includes the Power Shave Gel to get the ultimate wet shave experience. It's packed with skin soothing ingredients that defend against redness and irritation. And to finish off, we've got the Face Shave Soother and Aftershave Serum is a game changer. So you can get the Chairman Pro package today and experience a shave that is as smooth as you deserve. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using the code OUTSPOKEN for 20% off and free shipping. That's www.manscaped.com using the code outspoken stay on top of your grooming game and be ready for anything the season throws your way 
And Prince William actually wants to go further, David. He he was embarrassed by Charles's coronation. Mm-hmm. So are you saying, are you going as far to say that you feel like the British monarchy is having an identity crisis or or it is undoubtedly it's exactly what it's doing it's having a genuine identity crisis i mean let's face william i mean william's natural role in life is to be the manager of a second division football club that really is all he's capable of now normally this wouldn't matter because there would be a machinery around him Mm. um, that shepherded him in Mm. the right direction there isn't And instead, again, I think it is very much the king. Um, He thought that carving out, you know, niche roles in the environment or architecture or organic, whatever, was the right thing to do. He had this, and I understand it. I mean, being heir to the throne is a dreadful thing, Um, particularly as he was born to a young, healthy woman with most of his life, as it were, being spent in the waiting room. The way most princes of Wales have dealt with it is is by whoring around as much as possible and spending as much money as possible. And Charles, despite, you know, uh, his unfortunate marital experience, tried to give a decency and a purpose to it. But the trouble is, you then get this absurd idea that the role of the monarchy is to espouse causes. That's absurd. The the when when as it were you sought for something else other than the political uh, at the end of the nineteenth mm. century, you came up with this very different idea, which is the monarchy is the general sponsor of voluntary activity, is the general sponsor of the charitable sector. But you didn't particularly pick and choose your charities, and you didn't make an enormous fuss about one thing rather than another. You know, you were patron of the RSPCA, Mm -hmm. you were patron of hospitals, you were patron of this, that, and the other. Um, But what Charles did, he turned these things from a general sort of benefit regard to charitable activity into a cause. Now, the monarchy cannot be behind specific causes. And William has gone even further. Yes, yes. And of course, it leaves him then open to this terrible charge of hypocrisy. I mean, who could have been so silly as to think that William espousing homelessness. Mm. Here is a man who is even more over-accommodated than I am. You're right, I don't want the charge. I don't want the charge of hypocrisy. Here is somebody, you know, who has got different room, not simply for every day of the week, but for every day of the year and multiplied by several fold. And how you could be so infinitely ill-advised as to pick up the charge of homelessness. And again, you see, is why um, all the stuff that's come out about the Duchy of Cornwall and the Duchy of Lancaster, which is all really a load of absolute nonsense. All that's happening is that the professional managers of the Duchy of Cornwall and the Duchy of Lancaster are doing what any other landlord would do in their circumstances. That's all they're doing. But if you then have a monarchy, which is a patron of a hospital or a particular particularly um, uh, espousing homelessness, then, of course, it becomes so easy to say, oh, you know, they're taking directly from this kind of charity when at the same time they're saying all the rest of it should be given to it. Do you see what I mean? Yes, um, and, absolutely. And it, it is because they've lost that central sense of what they are. There's another enormous problem, Dan. Um, and if you actually look, for example, at the Netherlands, if you look at the Dutch football team, mm. what do they wear? What colour are their shirts? Orange. Yeah, because it's the House of Orange. Now, the great problem is Britain is different. We are three or four separate nations. Mm. And traditionally, the monarchy was the unifying bond. You didn't have citizenship. You swore allegiance to the crown. You still do, in theory. But Blair, in particular, tries to invent a new thing called British nationality. Now, the but the problem is, we never had a thing called British nationality. So you then had to invent this thing, which is really just a flag of convenience. What are, right, Dan, I'm giving you a test. Okay. What are British values? 
compared to English values. No, 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 no. What are British values? Come on, you should have it absolutely. You're failing it completely. You know, go to the bottom of the class. There are only two British values. They are democracy. No. Oh, what disgraceful prejudice! I mean, you're you're totally what, what, prejudiced. What, what, what? Tell me. Uh, right. They are two. They are two. They are tolerance. Yes. We believe in being tolerant, okay. don't we? Come on, get 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 the next one. God, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to leave you to find out. In other words, okay. what we did, what they did, they came up with this extraordinary definition yeah. of nationhood in which there is actually no content at all. You can swear to British values, and they have absolutely no meaning we believe in tolerance and diversity that's what we believe in we don't believe in other words what yeah, we yes, believe in is yeah. nothing yes and yes. this is the disaster um uh, we as i said the the thing be, be, because you know england and scotland um in particular but wales Ireland too had very very separate political mm. cultures would would were very similar nations but but were were separate and had distinctive features. It was it was that overarching allegiance to the monarchy that was. I mean, you look in your passport; um, it's framed like that. And until very recently, um, you were a British subject. You then have to reinvent this in into uh, with with all the problem of do people like you um, who were uh, subjects of the crown yes but with the separate identity of new zealand canada and all the rest of it when particularly we enter the common market there has to be this redefinition and what labor did it took particularly gordon brown it took the opportunity to come up with this pseudo nationhood we never used to call ourselves britons Britons are naked and daubed in blue paint, you know, and woad. Um, the, and so we've had to, inf nobody ever called themselves a Brit. That was the language that, that, that Fenian Republicans and aggressive Americans used to use to denounce us. Um, there have been the most interesting linguistic shifts, which, but again, one of the fundamental aspects of them is they've moved the monarchy to the margins of our national life. And there's this enormous hole that's left by this. There's a hole that's left in our national life. And there's an enormous hole that's left in the monarchy. You now have this huge post-imperial institution, that magnificent jewels and whatever, and a crown, which, I mean, to go back to the Wars of the Roses and that wonderful uh, uh, editing of Shakespeare's plays by the Royal Shakespeare Company back in the 1970s, we have hollow crown. We have a hollow nation and we have a hollow crown. And there's a vacuum at the heart of both of them. Well, and there's just this chip, chip, chipping away. I mean, you're obviously a CBE. Uh, front page of the Mail on Sunday at the weekend, radical reforms being considered by royal officials could see the word empire dropped from British honours. And what seems extraordinary about this story is that it appears to be being pushed much more by the palace than the government. Yes, I mean, and, and again, you see, it's also the thing that strikes me, Dan, is ignorance. Um, it's not simply insensitivity. It's not simply foolishness. It's not simply rashness. It's sheer, absolute ignorance. Can we discuss what the order of the British Empire was? Why it was created? It was created in 1917 at the height of the First World War to reward those who had fought in war and those who had organized war on the domestic front. It's unique because all the previous orders of chivalry, the garter, the, uh, you know, and we were talking about different nations. There were the different orders in each one of the different countries. In England, there was the garter, the bath, and the Michael and the George. Um, in, in Scotland, um, uh, 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 you, 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 you had, uh, sorry, in Ireland, um, you, you, you had, you had the, Patrick, and in Scotland, uh, the Order of St. Patrick, and in Ireland, you have the Order of the Thistle. But they all had tiny, tiny numbers. They were intended, the Garters only 24. They were only intended for an elite. What the, the 
CBE was what, sorry, what the Order of the British Empire was a genuine mass order. Mm. It was a direct consequence of democracy. It's the equivalent of the Légion d'honneur in France. And do you know where, again, just to give you an idea, do you know where the first investiture of the uh, Order of the British Empire takes place? No. Ibrox Park Football Stadium. With the king, not with the queen, with the king in khaki, with this vast tens of thousands of people present, with the two stars of the show were VC, brought, actually brought in on a stretcher, wow. so badly injured, and a little girl who'd been working in the munitions factories in Glasgow, and she received the British Empire Medal. And the British Empire has to be pinned, I think it is on the left breast of the woman. And the king was observed to play a great deal of time pinning this, this, this medal on the very attractive left breast of this little, uh, little, little girl who was wearing her coat overalls, her munition workers overalls. And if you remember, Edwardian dress, you had a very, very tight belt. And so there was this impressive structure, uh, which clearly caught the attention <laughs> of, of the Sailor King. Um, uh, but it was it was an extraordinary. Can you imagine? It's an extraordinary act of democracy, of yes. a kind of democratic order of chivalry. And this is the thing that they are rubbishing. That 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 they are that they are. They are treating again mm. with it's it's this terrible it's this terrible business of. Um, the elevation of words. It is seeing somehow the British Empire as a thing to be ashamed of. Whereas, of course, the British Empire is unique in the world in having given birth to free states, to Australia, to Canada, to New Zealand, to South Africa, flawed though it is, to India, even, even Israel fought over Palestine, the essential structures are the structures of common law to America, attended to the United States at an earlier point. This is something that seems to me to be an object of supreme pride. What yes. other empire has distributed freedom? Yes. And and, what, and, and, um, and, and, and it, but so again, yeah. it is this it is this 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 cringe that has been adopted by our public institutions and by the monarchy. So if the monarchy cringes, what is left? Mm. If, 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 the very, if the very head of our structure bows itself, kneels down in front of this. Um, and it is, what I fear Dan, is of course, that this opens the gates to republicanism. Um, yes. and, and again, it is the profound folly of those who are advising the monarchy. You cannot win. Making gestures towards the Guardian reading classes will not make the Guardian reading classes love you. This was the supreme folly of the Conservative Party under Cameron, under Osborne, under Gove. Making these noises don't make the opposition love you. They still hate you. As we've seen, it doesn't matter if you elect a black woman, who, by the way, is a first generation immigrant, something I'm, in America I think is illegal. Um, uh, actually, well, she was sort of born here, wasn't she? Um, but in America, remember, even in America, the land of immigration, there is the rule, you have to be at least second generation to be elected as president. You have to be born on American soil to be elected as president. But if, if we're having this constant cultural cringe, we're lost. But there's no point to it, as I said, that, that you don't gain anything from it. The Conservative Party has won no plaudits on the left for having a black no. leader. And the, again, this folly that was advanced by certain conservative, uh, certain conservative th so-called thinkers that, that somehow Kemi Badenoch, Badenoch would be insured against an attack from the left because she was black. Of course, we saw Dawn Butler. We, we had a whole section of the programme on it before. So you're engaged, yes. you're engaged in a task of simple folly yes. by compromise and backing down. So it sounds to me, and just, just to, to wrap this up, so you don't feel like the traditions of the royal family are safe in the hands of William and Catherine. Oh, I know we haven't mentioned Catherine. Okay, William. Um, uh, I think Catherine shows, uh, like so many, I mean, the House of Windsor largely depended on women. Yeah. 
let's be absolutely yeah. clear about this that the that the good sense of Queen, I mean, actually, George V is very impressive. But but if you actually look at the role uh, of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, um, uh, and the Queen Mary, and I think Kate, these are sensible, level-headed, forceful women. And uh, they have, as, as so often is the case, you're a case. You're a case. There, there's, there's a certain sort of immigrant, and these are immigrants into the royal family, that take the, you're an immigrant here, that take what they've immigrated into more seriously than most of the natives do, because it's a voluntary relationship. Um, and it seems to me that Catherine shows a complete understanding of what the role should be. Um, she is taking up you know, utterly uncontroversial things like mental mm. health, ever. Um, and that is deeply sensible. Um, so she's uh, arguably the same doing way, a better job you, than we you look, you, you look at Queen Camilla, yeah. reading um, domestic yeah, yeah, yeah. violence. These yeah. are entirely sensible and proper things. They don't have the flavour of climate change. They don't have the political flavour of homelessness. They are not. They are, they, they, they they apply to all classes and all races. Um, um, so I mean, I I I I I see in somebody like Kate um, a vastly sure of touch. Um, unfortunately, of course, she is ill. Um, we hope she is recovering. Um, and again, let me be quite clear about King Charles. I have enormous sympathy for him. Um, um, not simply because of the cancer and whatever. He is a man who is, I think, genuinely well-intentioned. Mm. But we all know what good intentions can do and that they pave the road, to, I'm afraid, the road to hell. And the real, my real criticism and it is the striking thing, again, it goes back to the reign of Elizabeth II, um, has been the general weakness of the private secretaries and the failure ever to have a really long serving private secretary. If you look back at the transformation of the monarchy in the uh, 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 from from the 1830s onwards, uh, in other words, from William the Fourth right through Victoria um, and and up to George V, you've got a handful. It's a tiny number. It's Ponsonby, it's Knight, um, it's um, Stamfordham, uh, and whatever. A tiny number of immense knolls, a handful of immensely able, very long serving private secretaries who act as a, not simply as a kind of defense of the monarchy, but as a genuine as a genuine fund of ideas. There's also something else which is really important. Um, if you look back at the monarchy surmounting the great crisis of the First World War and the revolutions which tore down all the other great imperial monarchies of Europe, um, the um, Austro-Hungary, Germany, Russia, and whatever. What's striking is the way the whole political class, ex-prime ministers and whatever, all rally round and take it seriously. The problem is that we've again got a political class, even on the conservative side, that doesn't particularly take it seriously, mm, that indeed. doesn't recognize why it matters. And once again, I view it all down with a sense of terrible, terrible sadness you know you wander around Westminster Abbey you go in there you look at what is represented there you see how it's been conserved developed cherished for centuries and you look how we are simply throwing it away letting it run through our fingers and it is very very sad it is indeed. What a worrying but important note to end on. David Starkey, thank you so much. And of course, David Starkey Talks, the YouTube revelation. David Starkey, now an important member of the independent media revolution. You know what, David, we're going to have some fun doing this, right? Because we don't have a commissioning editor. We don't have an editor. And actually, how great. <laughs> yes, it's a burden of responsibility, oddly. Yes. But it needs equally to be done with a smile. There's nothing better than humour. There's nothing better than tweaking the tail of the monster. 
indeed. Well, look, I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for being outspoken today. The brilliant, incomparable David Starkey. And thank you for your company too. Thank you so much for watching Dan Wooten Outspoken. Please click on my face just to the bottom left to subscribe to this brand new independent news source and turn on the notification bell so you'll be alerted to our brand new live shows, uncancelled interviews and special royal episodes. Outspoken is also now available as a podcast so you can listen to the show every weekday on the go wherever you are. 